So for today, we're going to talk about now uh, the other major join algorithm in, in a database system, so the sort merge. So last class, remember that we talked all about hash merging, and we said that uh, sort of hash joins, and hash joins were the most important operator in a uh, database system for doing overlap queries. So now we're going to look at the other major join algorithm, that's the sort merge. So we'll start off talking about the background of, of sort merge um, at a high level, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about SIMD instructions. So these are uh, single instruction, multiple data. These are special CPU intrinsics that do vectorized execution inside of a, in, in, you know, inside your database system to do this join algorithm. And we're going to need th these things in order to make this go faster, right? We didn't yet to do SIMD stuff for the Radex hash join we talked about last class, but to make the parallel sort merge join run fast, we have to use SIMD. Um, and so we'll have a whole other class where we talk about SIMD and vectorization later on. But I'm just going to give you, again, a quick purview of just everything at a high level, what you need to know to understand vectorization to make parallel sort merge work. It's quite an entrance there. You okay? Okay, he's okay. All right. And then we'll do an evaluation to talk about comparison between these different algorithms. And then we'll spend some time at the end uh, covering some of the hate mail we've gotten for the class. Um, I'm not going to use names, but we, we, we can discuss things. Okay. So. The sort merge join algorithm itself, the canonical version, is pretty straightforward, right? You basically, you have two phases. The first phase, you're going to sort the outer relation and the inner relation based on the join key. And then in the second phase, you're going to merge them to do two together and find matches. And the merging is basically just walking through the, the sorted relations one by one and doing a comparison on the join key to see whether you have a match. Um, typically, you only have to scan the outer relation once. Right? So in this case, it's R. And depending on whether you have duplicates or not, you may have to backtrack in the inner relation and go back and, and scan through pieces of, it, uh, pieces of it over again. And so this is, this is sort of the standard textbook implementation of a uh, sort merge join. And essentially, it looks like this. There's a sort of visualization of it. Say we have our two relations, R and S. They start off being unclustered, unsorted on our join key. So in the first phase, we'll do some join out, we'll execute some join algorithm, pick whatever one you want to use. And then now we have a sorted band or these uh, sorted runs of each table. And then in the case when we do the merge join, we just walk through each tuple one by one. And if we're doing echo join, we just compare the, you know, at each position for every other tuple in other position. So every time we, we move down in one on the outer relation, we check to see whether we have a match in the inner relation. If so, then we emit it in our output. If not, then we move on to the next one then do the comparison again, right? So you're just sort of going through sequentially for each of these, and you produce the output. So the history of the sort merge join versus the hash join, uh, it's sort of like a, a debate that's, that's been going on in database systems since the very beginning. So before, there was like NoSQL versus NewSQL, or NoSQL versus SQL. Uh, the, the major debate was whether a sort merge join was better than a hash join. So in the very beginning of the 1970s, the IBM guys came out with a paper that, um, based on the system R system, and they said that sort merge join is actually preferable to the hash join. Um, it's going to be faster, and you get better performance with it. And you have to understand at the time, obviously, DRAM was very limited. So back then, uh, they didn't have a hash join that required, uh, that could use data that was either in memory and out of memory, right? The hash join back then had required all the hash table to be entirely in main memory. Whereas the sort merge join that they could support, they would just rely on the sort of canonical external merge sort algorithm that allows you to sort large data sets that are larger than the amount of DRAM that's available. So back in the 70s, they were said sort merge is the way to go. And then around the early 1980s, uh, hashing, hash joins became in vogue again. And this was partly due because there was all of this, these new, what were called database machines uh, systems. So now you maybe call them database appliances. So I sort of think of it as like specialized hardware, like a one rack unit uh, that, that was designed specifically to execute a uh, you know, database workload. Uh, they don't really make database machines anymore. Um, but they think of it as a general, uh, specialized system just for do database stuff. And so what they had was they had specialized hardware in these database machines that could do hashing really fast. And what they found is starting in 1983 and up until like 1988, they found that the hash join was faster than the sort merge join. 
Then in the 1990s, there was uh, one of the optional papers on the website was uh, this comparison of the sort merge join and hash join, the you know, ha sort, sorting versus hashing revisited. And what they basically found out in that paper was that they're, ba they're more or less basically the same. At a high level, semantically, the two algorithms are doing the same thing, <clears throat> and the performance is roughly the same. Then <clears throat> in the 2000s, uh, there was some work in the late 2000s, and was one of the optional papers we read. Uh, they found that doing hashing was actually now faster than, uh, than sorting. And now we are in the sort of the 2010s, and the paper you guys were required to read is basically the latest incarnation, the latest bout around of comparing these two joint algorithms. So I won't, I won't, if you read the paper, you know what the answer is, but I, I, we'll get to it at the end. So this is sort of the state of the art of where we're at now in terms of joint algorithms. <clears throat> so there's three major thrusts, three major works that were, again, part, part of the readings. So the first is you have a paper in 2009 by Oracle and Intel, where they found that the hash join, the radix hash join that we talked about last class, is faster than a sort of parallel sort merge join algorithm. Um, but what they noted is that if you uh, have wider SIMD registers, and I'll explain what I mean that in a second, uh, then you can actually do better in a sort merge. But if the current Intel hardware doesn't support the wide registers that they were talking about here. But eventually, at some point, it could, and therefore, it, the balance might now switch back over to sort, sort merge. Then in 2012, there was a paper by the Hyper guys out of Germany, uh, and where they came out with a parallel version of sort merge uh, that was NUMA aware, so being mindful of the layout of data in memory. And what they found is that their sort merge uh, join algorithm is actually already faster than a hash join, even, even without having to use SIMD instructions. So then now the, the, the paper you were assigned to read came out of the, uh, the systems group at ETH in Zurich. And so there was a paper they had in 2013, right before the one that, that you guys read, um, where they have now a faster version, a parallel version of, of Radix hash join that actually outperforms the, the, the parallel uh, sort and merge join that the, the, the hyper guys came up with. So we'll go through all these uh, one by one, but this is sort of where we're at now. So, the SIMD stuff, the way to think about this is that it's a, so the special instructions that are going to be in the CPU that allow you to do vectorized execution on data. So typically you think of like, um, if you use like, uh, you know, in a number plus number equals something, that's considered a SISD instruction. So single instruction, single data. Under SIMD, you're going to take this one single instruction that you, that you execute in the CPU, and that instruction is going to be able to do that operation across multiple data items. So this term SIMD or SISD, it actually comes from Flynn's taxonomy of parallel architectures, which came out in the 1960s, basically ways to describe uh, different execution paradigms or architectures in, in a CPU. So the SIMD stuff is sort of one, one aspect of this. So the current Intel and AMD chips all have a microarchitecture support to do SIMD operations. So when it first came out in the, the mid-1990s, uh, Intel had MMX, and then AMD had uh, 3D Now. And these early variations had a lot, of, a lot of problems, like when you when you did stuff on these, you couldn't do, couldn't execute other operations on regular operations on, on the CPU. And then now where we're at now, which we'll talk about for this class, are all these streaming SIMD extensions, SSE, SS2, SS3, um, and AVX is the latest one. And these are the ones we're going to focus on here. And again, the basic idea is going to allow us to take multiple data items, do, execute one instruction, and get uh, multiple outputs. So I remember when I was younger, like in the 90s, I remember like, you know, back then you worried about, you know, the megahertz of your CPU and things like that. And I remember, you know, we had like a Pentium 2 or 3 that had MMX. I didn't understand what the hell it meant. It just like total Intel marketing. Like there's a special thing you definitely wanted, uh, even though you, if you didn't know, if nothing actually ever used it. You can kind of think of this as what GPUs are doing, right? GPUs are doing the same thing. They're, they're doing uh, vectorized execution across a, lo uh, a lot of data items at the same time. Just so they have tons of more threads than, than a general purpose CPU does. So the one we're going to focus on is the SSE stuff. And these are basically a special collection of instructions that target these 128-bit registers. So the way to think about this is that you have your regular DRAM, and then you can have these special registers that you can read and write to using intrinsics that can then be uh, used, these SSE uh, instructions. 
And so the, for in this case here for SSE, you can do, you have a 128-bit register, that means you can pack in four 32-bit integers or scalar values on that. Then you invoke one operation, and it'll output another 128-bit uh, register. So this was introduced by Intel in the 1990s, 1999, after the MMX stuff came out. So this is like the improved version of all that. So let's look at a simple example. So say we want to do a vector addition, right? We're going to do x plus y equals z. And this is the basic, you know, if, if you did do it, write it out in math, it would look like this. If you had to write it out in code, uh, it would just basically be a for loop where you're going to iterate through every single value of x and y, and then you're going to add them together and output it on z. So to do this with a SysD instruction, you basically just have to loop through every single element of the two vectors, apply the, the, the addition operator, and then output it to your output buffer. And you just go down the line and do this one by one. So every single one time, time you're looking at these two numbers, that's a, you know, it's one instruction to execute that. Yes, it's very fast, because you know, modern CPUs can do addition very quickly, but you're doing this over and over again. So now with SIMD, what we're going to do instead is, instead of, the, instead of going through like in a for loop and going down one by one, we're going to combine together the first four elements into a 128-bit uh, SIMD register. Right? We're just packing the bits one by one in, into, into the slots. And then now it's one invocation to the SIMD instruction, and then it'll output its own, uh, it, it'll output the result of that operation in another 128-bit uh, register. So we do the same thing for the next four elements, one SIMD instruction, and boom, and we have our output. So what was before, it was eight addition operations to go through every single element in the, uh, in, in the vectors. Now with SIMD, it's just one. Or sorry, it's just two. Right? So that's you know, it's four times as, as fewer instructions. So you see why the SIMD stuff is really important, and we can exploit this in our algorithms to get much better performance. So the it seems like a magical thing we would want to use for everything, and yes, the performance difference you can get is quite significant. The downside that is, it is kind of tricky to use, right? So there's no compiler that I know of that it handles auto vectorization for for any possible algorithm that you could have. So typically, what happens is, in order to take advantage of SIMD, you have to, you as the database developer, have to carefully code whatever it is that you're doing to make calls to the CPU intrinsics, right? And what, so we talked about CPU intrinsics before. What, what are what are they? What's that? That's an example of one. At a high level, what's a, what's an intrinsic? Sort of right. So it, it's it's. It's, it's, although you make a call like, as if it's a function, it's really a compiler directive that then gets translated exactly to the assembly calls to apply whatever the operation you want to apply. Right? So it's, sort of, it's not like making a call and look up in the function table to say, what function do I got to call? It's like inline assembly that, that the compiler will automatically do for you. So for all these different, uh, for all the different sort of scalar types you can have, there's all these different SIMD instructions that allow you to write them into, the, to, to these, into those registers and pull them out and do other types of things. So we'll focus, we'll discuss more about SIMD instructions when we talk about vectorization. Um, but the main thing is that it's, you as the programmer are probably going to have to spend time writing the code using intrinsics in order to, to use them. The compiler is not going to do this for you automatically. And then you also have to be very careful about how you align the data in the registers. So in the example I showed before, it was a 128-bit register, so we were able to put four 32-bit values in there. But we have to be very careful when we pack in other, other things. Right? And then uh, moving data in and out and scattering around and doing shuffling is very tricky and at times can be quite inefficient. Right? So in the newer versions of the SSE uh, extensions, they have the ability to sort of move data from one SIMD register to another, so that you don't have to go through the DRAM or CPU caches. So they have a lot of ways to, to make this uh, work a little more efficiently than, than you would treating it just as a, you know, a, dump, a thing you dump things in and out. You can move in between the registers very quickly. So again, we'll discuss more about all uh, SIMD stuff later on, uh, but this is the high level of what we have to care about. So you may be asking at this point, why not just use a GPU instead of the SIMD stuff, right? Because GPUs are designed to do all these vectorized execution stuff very, very efficiently. So, and so the answer is that, as far as I know, except for one particular system, there's no general purpose database system that's out there today that uses GPUs for anything. 
Right? And the issue is because it's, it, the bandwidth between the sort of DRAM, that CPU's memory, and the memory for the GPU itself is really slow because you had to go through the PCI Express bus. Right? So that means that like, you'd have to, you know, in order to compute some query you, on a GPU, you'd have to take the data that you wanted to process, load it into the GPU first, then do whatever the, the, the parallelized execution you wanted to do, and then look, you know, extract the answer out. And that's, can, that can be really slow. So there are, uh, the only system that I know that uses a GPU is a system called MAPD. Um, it's actually kind of a cool story. There's this guy who was, he was doing a PhD in like humanities at Harvard, decided to walk down Vassar Street to where MIT is and took their database course, ended up building his own sort of query engine to help him visualize tweets for the Arab Spring uh, using GPUs. And they eventually made a company of it, and that's what the MAPD uh, system's about. And the way they get around the problem of the slow bandwidth on the PCI Express bus is that they just load the entire database in memory, and every single query is a complete sequential scan across that entire data. Right? And it's really fast because they have a ton of threads. They can just do this very quickly. But that means that the database is essentially read-only because it's sitting in the GPU. They can't run transactions on it. They can't you know, do fast updates and things like that. So we'll discuss more of this when we talk about vectorization. But in general, GPUs aren't going to help us. Now, there are a bunch of these merging coprocessors that are coming out in, in newer hardware that, may, that, are, that are able to share the DRAM memory of the CPU uh, on this separate thing without, without having to go over the PCI Express bus. So AMD has their accelerated processor unit units. Intel has their Knight's Landing chip and the Xeon Phi. So these are some, some interesting hardware that's coming out in the future that I think actually that do the vectorized execution, like the SIMD stuff, but can access DRAM directly. So I think these things are some, some cool things we can look at later. OK, so that's sort of a crash course uh, in five, 10 minutes about SIMD stuff. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss more of that later on in the lecture after spring break. All right, so now we want to talk about how to do parallel merge, sort merge joins. So obviously, the most expensive aspect of a sort merge join algorithm is always the sorting. Right? The merging is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, the sorting is always going to kill us. And so before, we used to say, oh, just run quick sort or whatever you want to, you know, off the shelf. Sorting algorithm, that's good enough. Uh, but now if we want to take advantage of our current Harvard landscape, so that means not only the, the sort of the NUMA regions and interconnect between them, but also having a lot of CPU cores, then we want to be a little more careful about how we're going to do this, this sort, sorting step at the sorting phase. So I'm going to go through the different phases of a sort merge join algorithm in more detail, and this is all based on what the, the, the paper you guys were assigned to read. So in the first phase, although it's not always the first, uh, is you can have the same kind of partitioning step that we saw in the radix hash join, where we're going to take our, our, our one of our tables and we're going to split it up into different NUMA regions and assign them, or, or chunks, and we assign them to different uh, sockets so they have their own NUMA regions. And the idea is that we want to partition the database such that uh, each core only operates on data that's local to it. And, and for this particular algorithm we're going to look at, we're only going to merge, we're only going to partition, that should be R, we're only going to partition the outer table. Then in the second phase, we obviously do our sort based on the join key, and then we can do our merge, uh, where we just sort of walk through each of them one by one and try, try to find matches. So we're going to go through each of these phases one by one. So for the partitioning phase, I want to describe this in terms of what I'll call explicit partitioning and implicit partitioning. So the implicit partitioning would be the morsel stuff that we talked about before, where when the database was loaded, the database system made a decision that, all right, well, this, this region is going to go to this socket, and this region is going to go to that socket. So when we start the uh, sort merge join algorithm, our data is sort of more or less already partitioned in some manner across the different cores. And I'll differentiate this between explicit partitioning, where no matter whether we, we've done the, the morsel thing where we split things up in the beginning, uh, we're going to explicitly partition our, our tables based on our join key and redistribute the data across the different cores. So even though when we start, we're already sort of split up in uniform chunks on every single core, we're going to go through a scan through the table, look at the join key, and hash it using the radix partitioning the approach we had talked about before, and then move the data to some other socket. Right? So that's, and different algorithms can choose to do this or not do this, right? And we'll, we'll talk about the trade-offs as we go along. 
So this is what I mean by explicit versus implicit. Implicit means it's already there, it's already partitioned. Explicit means we'll do an extra, we're doing extra work to redistribute. So now we'll talk about the sort phase. So in the sort phase, uh, what we're going to produce are we'll call sorted runs. And a run is basically some contiguous uh, set of tuples, contiguous list of tuples that have been sorted. So you can think of it like in the beginning, you chunk the database or you partition the da your table into these, these, these disjoint sets. And then we'll create a run from them is, is when we sort them. And the runs that doesn't necessarily have to be the entire chunk of data. Right? The chunk of data can be broken up to different sorted runs that are locally sorted but not globally sorted. So again, in the old days, quick sort was good enough, but now we need to be more careful when we deal with NUMA architectures and parallel architectures. So essentially what we're trying to achieve is what is called cache conscious sorting. And that means that we want to be mindful of the amount of memory or the amount of, uh, uh, yeah, the amount of memory, the amount of cache we have at different levels in the CPU and are being aware of what memory is close to us, right, on our NUMA socket. So I didn't know a good way to how to describe this, uh, and they don't use this term in the paper, so this is sort of my own, my, my own taxonomy. But the basic idea is that we want to have different levels of sorting. And then as we get to larger run sizes, we want to switch to a different approach to do, to do our sorting. So at the very beginning, what I'll call, what I'll call level one, we want to generate sort, uh, sorted runs that can fit in our SIMD registers. And then once we realize that now we have all these, these, these sorted runs, we need to start combining them because we want to have, in the end, a, a giant global run of the entire table, we need to switch to level two and use a different algorithm that can deal with generating runs that fit in our CPU caches. And once we know that we're beyond our CPU caches, then we switch to level three where we deal with out of cache sorting, where we may have to go read and write things from, from DRAM. So I'll go through each of these one by one, but here's sort of a high-level overview of what's going to happen. So here's, our, here's one of our relations. In the very beginning, it's completely unsorted, right, based on our join key. So this is different from, it doesn't matter whether it's clustered on something or not. Uh, this, you know, assume we're, we're joining on something that it's not sorted on. So it's completely unsorted. Then in level one, we want to generate our, our, our runs that can fit in our registers. Then at level two, we'll generate runs that can fit in our CPU caches, and in this case, it has to be half the size of our L3 cache. Why does that have to be half the size of L3 cache? Uh, no, it's, 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 you, you need half for the input and half for the output. Yeah. All right, and then once we go beyond L3 cache size or half, half of L3 cache, then we'll switch to the level three where we can generate uh, sorted runs that are larger than our cache, and then we end up in the final the final stage, we have our complete sorted table. So we're going to go through each of these one by one. So for level three, again, this is the in-register in uh, sorting uh, method we want to use. We're going to use a technique called sorting networks. So sorting networks is an old idea that actually was developed in the 1940s. Um, and the basic way to think about it is you can, you can think of it as just sort of this actual hardware device that's comprised of wires. And the wires will maintain the value of one, of one of these input slots. And then we'll have these comparators where we'll compare the, whatever the value that exists on this wire at this point in, the, in time. And we'll put the smallest value on the top and the largest value on the bottom. All right, so let's say in the very beginning, our input sequence is 9536. So in this first part here, well, this value 9 goes to this point, this value 5 goes to this point. And because 5 is smaller, it goes on the top. And 9 is, is larger, it goes on the bottom. And then the same thing for this one here. 3 stays on the top, 6 goes on the bottom. And then now, at this point here, after this comparator, 6 is, on, is, the, is the value on this wire, 3 is on the value of this wire, 9 is the value here, and 5 is the value here. So then this then feeds into the next comparator, where we do the same comparison again. Now 3 is on the top, and 5 is on the bottom. Now, at this point, we see that for this wire, there's no other comparator for it. So we know we're never going to have to do another comparison. So therefore, we can immediately put it in our output buffer. Right? And we do the same thing for the next guy, 6 and 9. 9 doesn't have, it doesn't have anything else after it, so it goes, goes in the output. And then 5 and 6, and then we, and we get our output here. All right? So now our output is, is the sorted list of what was given to us as input. So the... 
key thing to understand about sorting networks is the layout of the pass, so the wire pass in these comparators is always the same regardless of what values you have here on in the input list. Right? It's all, it depends on the size of the input list that you're sorting. So what I mean by that is say if I, no matter what values I have in here, as long as I have four values I want to sort, the layout of the comparators on the wire is, is always going to be exactly the same. And the significance of that is it makes it really efficient to actually implement and code, and especially using SIMD instructions, because we don't have any branching you would have in like a quick sort or, or another sorting algorithm, right? There's no like, if this value is less than this, go this way. If this value is greater than that, go that way. It's always a straight like min max goes, you know, min goes here, max goes there, right? And this can make it it's, it's super easy to implement, and we can use SIMD to speed all this up. So to, give, to show how to do this now with more registers, so let's say that we have uh, four different values and four different registers, so four different sequence of values with four elements each, because we can have our 128-bit SSC register, so we can sit, put in four 32-bit values. And we want to sort these guys. So in the very beginning, the only, we only have to execute four load instructions to take the value that exists in, in, in DRAM and lo load it into our, our registers. Then in the next we think step, we want to sort across the registers. So in this case here, we're not sorting the list horizontally, we're sorting vertically. And we can just do min and max to make this work, right? We don't have to do an if branch, right? We can use the, the SIMD min and max instructions to compute this, and we only have to do 10 of them. And this is essentially doing the same sorting network wiring diagram that I showed before. But now the problem is so we're sorted vertically, right? But we're not sorted horizontally. And we, what we want is we want a sorted run that can fit in uh, one of these registers, right, going across. So we want to put these four values and we want to transpose them so that instead of being sorted in this way, they, we want them to be sorted in that way. And so there's these shuffle operators in SIMD that allow you to do this manipulation to move bits around without, without having to go back to the CPU memory or the CPU caches. You can just do this directly on the SIMD registers themselves. And then now in order to get this data out of the registers and put it into our, our memory, which is going to be like you know, L1, L2 cache, we use a store instruction to extract the values and, and move them out. Right, so, we, so again, we're not globally sorted, right? Because 1, 5, 9, 12, 8 is, is, is less than 9. So globally, we're not sorted. We're only sorted within you know, four individual values. But that's OK. That's what we want in our level 1 sorting. Yes? The question is, why don't we sort horizontally in this step here rather than sorting vertically? Because the SIMD instructions can't sort within, you can't run min and max for things that are in the same register. Think of these as registers, right? Remember the example I showed before when I did like the vector addition? It was like this register plus this register equals some other register. So, so we're taking this slot into this slot and we'll do min and max on them. It's a good question. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. So if I understand correctly, if you have wider SIMD, you can extend the horizontal. Correct, yes. Yeah, the question is, if you had, so when Intel says, I wish we had wider SIMD, we can do better, better sort merge, you would have more elements going across here. I think the newer instructions, I think it's like 256-bit registers. Um, for now, for simplicity, we're, do, we're doing 128. And obviously, if you have a 64-bit long, that makes this a little more complicated as well. OK. So, so, now, all right, so we're, now, we're at level one. So we have now, we have a bunch of these four value you know, runs that are sorted. So now we need to start merging them and combining them together. So this is what level two is. So one thing that's confusing about the, the, the paper is that there's sort of two merging operations, merging steps, right? There's the merge within the sort merge of the sort phase, and then there's the merge of the merge join. So I'll try to be very careful, when, be, you know, be precise in what kind of merge we're talking about. So at this point here, we're doing the merge of sort merge, not the merge of the merge join. Okay? All right, so to do combine all these now cache size sort of runs, or, or register, register size sort of runs, we want to use what's called a big tonic merge network. 
And you can essentially think of it as just like a, a, a larger sorting network than we talked about before. But instead of sorting within a single register, uh, it's going to do sorting across uh, multiple locally sorted registers and produce a larger list. And the idea is that we just keep getting bigger and bigger uh, merge networks to allow us to sort and or to allow us to merge larger sorted runs until we fill up our cache, half of our cache size. So the approach I'm going to talk about at a high level that comes from this paper written by Intel in 2008, where they showed that their implementation of a Batonic merge network using SIMD gets about 2.25 to 3.5x speed up over a single instruction, single data implementation. So this is pretty significant, right? Because think about like sorting. It's pretty old topic, right? A lot of the quick sort from some of the 70s, a lot of that stuff was done in the early days. And there's not some magic unless you know P equals N NP that's going to make sorting go so much faster. So to get this kind of speed up by taking advantage of new hardware resources is pretty significant. So the Bitonic network sort of looks like this. So this is doing a 4x4 four four merge. Um, and you can go larger, and they show how to, in this paper. And basically, the whole network just gets larger. And so what we have is our first input. We're going to have a sorted run generated by a level one sorting network. And then we'll have another sorted run from, from level one. But in this case here, it's going to be in reverse order. So basically, we'll do our, our, our sort using the sorting network in level one, and we'll just flip, flip everything around so that the largest element comes first and the small element comes last. And the reason why we want to do this is that when we start doing the min and max comparisons, uh, just like we did in the sorting network, we want to compare the smallest element of the second list to the largest element of the first list. Right? Because remember, think of, sort of, we're, think of this sort of vertically going down. We have our registers, and we want to be, compare like, from this slot to this slot and produce an output that way. So that's why we have to reverse this. And then in the middle, we have that transpose and shuffle phase where we move things around to get them to line up to now then do the next round of minimaxes, do another shuffle, and then do more minimaxes. And then we end up with our sorted output here. So this sorted run will have eight elements where we took two four element lists as our input. Right? And again, as you can imagine, since these are all min and maxes, you can implement this with SIMD. So now we get to level three. So we can do the Bitonic merge network thing uh, up until we have runs that are half our cache size. And then at some point, we have to start going out to DRAM and swapping things in and out. So instead, instead of using this, the Bitonic merge network, we want to adapt it in such a way uh, that we can do, do our out of, out, of, out of cache sorting more efficiently. So the basic idea of how this is going to work is that we're going to use one worker thread per partition. And we're going to have multiple uh, Bitonic merge networks linked together. And they're going, to, they're going to read data in from a queue, do the merge, and then produce an output to another queue. And the idea is that there's going to be one thread that's going to do all the merging. So what it does sort of task level scheduling, user level scheduling, where it checks all every queue. If, it's, if it has an element, then it does whatever the merge it can do until the queue is full or the output queue is full. And then it blocks that task and switches to another task. This is not multiple thread jumping around doing this. This is one thread doing its own scheduling. And this sounds like very expensive. This sounds like a lot of work. And what the ETH guys claim is that by doing this jumping around and doing a little bit of merging here, a little bit of merging there, and just letting the data flow work itself out through these queues, is that you pay extra CPU overhead, but in exchange, you get better balance of the, the memory controller's bandwidth. Right? You get better utilization over time. The way to think about this is like, well, maybe I'll switch to the diagram, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So here's our sorted runs from level two. And then they're going to feed into a, uh, a, a, a Bitonic merge network that we just talked about. And then the output gets put into one of these FIFO queues. And then when there's now elements in here that can then be used by this merge operator, it then pulls it and does whatever it needs to do and then pushes it to, to the next queue. So the idea is that if there's nothing for this guy to pull from its queues, it just waits. 
It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's a single thread, so it's not going to sit on a latch. It just knows that there's nothing for me to do at this operator, so I'll jump to another operator. And likewise, this guy is farther downstream. He doesn't have anything to work on, so he, he just waits. So, and so what I mean by having better balance between the memory bandwidth and the CPU resources is that if you didn't have this sort of split up and this jumping around, well, what would happen is you would, your, and your thread would go say, all right, I need to merge, this, th merge these two chunks together. Let me go to DRAM, go fetch it in. Then I'm going to spin my CPU cycles while I merge that, that data, all the while my memory controller is, is doing nothing. Maybe you can do some prefetching, but pro probably not. And then I'm done doing the, the, the sorting those two chunks. Then I go back to pulling more data in. And now my CPU is idle while I'm going pulling things in. So in this case here, by jumping around, while we're waiting for something else to, to get pushed to us, we can then do computation somewhere else. So it seems like in the end, we're, we're spending more cycles to do more work, doing all the scheduling for ourselves, but we're making better usage of, of our hardware. Does everyone understand this? Yes? Say it, say it again. When you say that it, it blocks because it does not have any other input data, yes. there's another word. You see, so, so don't think of these merge blocks as a separate thread. Yeah. Think of one thread just jumping around all the time. Do I have something to do? It recognizes my queue is empty, so it knows not to go do anything here. Jumps yeah, jump, jumps to something else that has work to do. His question is, how do you make the decision about what other? You can just look at the yeah, usually, yeah. I, like you can, you can keep track of global counters. So it's a single thread. We don't have to worry about synchronization across these queues. So we just know that, oh, well, the thing I need to do, you know, this guy here is, is waiting for something here. When this guy pushes something to the queue, update a global counter and says he has something to go, something to work on. For this whole thing. We'll see in a second. This is like. This would be done by one core, because it's operating on some slice of the data. But all the cores are basically doing the same thing. Yes? What's that? His, his question is, what level of cache is this being, is it using this? Private or shared. Oh, it's private or shared. Uh, do you mean like a CPU cache or like output buffers? You, you, yeah, so this would be using the, 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 I don't think it's making a distinction between L1, L2, L3 here. Like you don't, you can't like, t you can't tell the CPU, put this thing in L3, put this thing in L2. It just does it for you. Yeah, so, so this merge is using the Bitonic merge network. So that's all SIMD as much as possible, right? But then you have to materialize the output. You have to take it out of the, the SIMD registers, put in some kind of output buffer, so this guy can then process it. And that's just writing the DRAM, a DRAM location, right? And so yes, when you do the first write, it'll end on L1. Then eventually, as you swap other things in, it'll end on L2, L3. But you don't really have any control of that. The CPU just does it for you. So uh, 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 memory ping pong between some yeah, so his question, his statement is, will you have memory ping-ponging because uh, I'm running here and I do as much work as I can, and then I run out of stuff to do, and then I jump over here, and now everything that was in L1 down here gets thrown out because I'm pulling stuff in. Yes, absolutely. But they, they claim that this is better because the, the overall utilization is better than having localized execution. In the back. Uh, from what I understood, they size the FIFO such that the size is less than L1, so. Yeah, yeah correct, yeah. These are all, yes, yeah, so each of these are like the L1 cache size. OK? Yes? Uh, the size of each of these buffers keeps on doubling after every level. So does that cover the problem? The question is, the size of these buffers keep getting. The size of these queues. Because the merges will merge to. Yeah, so the, the, the element of the queue can be a L1 cache size. But yes, it'll get longer. There's, there's no other way to get around that. Because you have to merge these, these larger things. Okay.
So then we come to the merge phase. So we, we've done our L1, our level one, level two, level three sorting. Uh, and now we're gonna walk through our sorted runs and just again, iterate through each one by one, check to see whether we have a match. And if we do, then we can put it in our output buffer. And we're not gonna discuss whether the output buffers are the private buffers or the shared buffers, like, like we did talk about the hash join. All of the same sort of technology, all the same uh, synchronization issues and merging issues are, are applicable there, right? So there's not much. There's not much you can you can sort of speed this up other than dividing the work up, up between the different cores. Um, except maybe uh, except maybe just in time compilation. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. So the three sort of high level sort merge join algorithms that we can have are the multi way sort merge join, the multi pass sort merge join, and then these are the two from the paper you guys read from ETH. And then this is the hyper massively parallel sort merge join algorithm. So I'll go through each of these, and then we'll talk about the evaluation of all of them. So the multi-way sort merge is essentially the same thing, exactly what I just described to you in terms of all the steps. So we'll do when everything fits on uh, in our caches or memory, or in our, in our caches and registers. We'll do a level one, level two sorting, and then we'll redistribute our data that we generate from level two into across the different cores and doing the multi-way. Uh, merging using the Pictonic networks that we just talked about. And then for the inner table, we'll do the exact same thing we do with the outer table. And then our merge phase will be between pairs or chunks of the inner table and the outer table that are, that, that are stored on the same CPU core. So to show an example here, so we have our outer table. And in the very beginning, let's just say we do the same implicit partitioning that the, that the hyper guys did with their morsels so that our data is sort of just automatically split up between the different cores. So then in the first step, we'll do our, our sorting, and this will all be on the local data that we have in our NUMA region. So this is the level one, level two. Then we want to do our level three multi-way merge. And for that, we're going to transfer data within a, a particular region or range from our different cores and put them all on one core. And then it can do that, that multi-way uh, level three uh, merge sort. And we'll do this for all, all the other ones. So now we have, again, on every single core, they have data that is uh, within some range that are close together. So then we, add, then we do our, 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 our sorting, and then we have now, for these chunks, we have our sorted runs. So now on the inner table, we're going to do the exact same thing. I'm not going to draw out the full thing. I'll just say this, this sort piece here this represents all of this. So now what you see is that going across horizontally at a single core, all the data that was in, within a range that's sorted for, for, for this core matches up with the data in this core. So when we will now do our local merge join, all we have to do is compare the tuples in this chunk with the tuples in that chunk without having to do anything cross partitions. Right? Because we redistributed everything when we did the multi-way mer merge here. So obviously this can be done in parallel. Like every single core can blast through their inputs, not have to synchronize with anybody else, and write their output to whatever the buffer they're using. Yes. So given the extreme case where the the table on the left has one tuple that matches every tuple, right? You would have to do. How would you? How do you partition them to make sure that only the data on each core for each table might be? So the, que the question is, you, you know, your first example was, what if you have exactly one, a one-to-one -one match between the two tables? So you have like one tuple on the left, which matches everything on the right. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, so the question is, if you have one tuple here that would match everything here, then when you did this, this partitioning stuff, this thing would just be massive. Okay. Right? And yes, that, that's the worst case scenario. There's no getting around that. I mean, that's, that's rare, right? If you have a billion tuples, it's unlikely you're going to have. So I guess my question is, you partition based on the actual, I mean, on elements in the right now, just the size. You have to do like a static. The question is, the, when you do this redistribution here, it's not just like 10 go here, 10 go there. It's, yeah, you could build a histogram and do that same radix partitioning stuff we talked about before, and that split it up that way. Right? I'm not telling, I haven't said like, how do you assign what, what chunk goes to this, this thing here? The Redis partitioning is, is one way to do it. I mean, it has to be some function of the, of the data itself, not 
Absolutely, absolutely yes. But it has to match with whatever you use over here so that, so, so that they line up. OK. So uh, the other approach, and I, I didn't actually fully understand this myself, but they, instead of doing the multi-way uh, le level three merging, they just only do the level two stuff. And it's sort of called a naive multi-pass uh, naive, multi naive merge. And you're not going to redistribute the data. You're just going to sort whatever you have locally. And then you do a comparison across the different cores when you do the merge join. So this is sort of like a naive implementation of a, a parallel sort merge join algorithm that doesn't take advantage of the, the multi-way stuff we talked about before. And we'll see how it compares later on. The last approach is from the hyper guys. Uh, and this, in this approach, what they're going to do is they're going to, even though the data is laid out in sort of the morsels ahead of time, they're going to do explicit range partitioning of the outer table in the beginning, redistribute it to across the cores. And then every core is now going to sort whatever data they have locally based on the join key there. And then in the inner table, you're not going to do the, the range partitioning instead. You're just going to sort whatever data you already have locally. And then when you do the merge join, you're going to have to compare across NUMA regions, across sockets, uh, for every single, one, every single chunk of data in the inner table with one chunk of the outer table. So I'll explain this now. All right, so say we, we have our, our morsels already ahead of time. And then now we'll do cross NUMA partitioning. So again, we can use that same radix partitioning approach before where we as, as, as Matt was saying, we, we decide how to split things up based on the actual values of the data themselves, rather than just sort of randomly picking whatever. So now, each of these cores will then sort whatever data they have locally. On the inner table, we'll, we'll do, uh, we don't do redistribution. We just sort locally on what data we have. So that means that there could be tuples within one chunk here that matches up with tuples across any possible chunk. So now when you want to do the merge join, you have to go across partitions. So you'll take, start off with this guy here, and you'll scan through sequentially the entire thing, entire, the entire sorted run here, but then only a segment of the sorted run that corresponds to the range partition boundary that this, this chunk here represents. So this data here only has a portion of it. This core only has a portion of the data that would, could possibly match here. So we know we only need to scan a portion of it. So then we do this for all the other ones. And we always have to do a sequential scan of the, of the data within, within, uh, within the outer table. And then we'll do the same thing for the next table, do that same uh, sequential scan, and across, across all the other ones as well. So this seems like a lot of work, right? Because we're doing sort of multiple passes over the, of these guys here. But the hyper guys make an argument that these doing sequential scans on contiguous sorted runs in memory is much more efficient than having to do the random writes that you have to do when you do a multi-way merge sort, as, like, like in, in the first algorithms. So they have a bunch of precepts or edicts that they claim that this is the way to actually implement a, a, a high-performance efficient parallel algorithm in, in a database system. So the first rule will say that you never want to have your core do any random writes to, to memory that's not local to your core. Right? So that, that, that's why they do that redistribution in the first step, so that they can split everything up in the beginning. And yes, that is some random writes, but that's fewer random writes than you would have to do in the multi-way case. The second rule is that if you ever have to read from your, from your neighbor, from your from, from the core that's not local to you, then you won't always want to do a sequential read. And the reason behind this is that it's going to allow the harbor prefetcher to prefetch memory from the remote NUMA region and bring it to your local memory uh, much more efficiently than if you just had to jump around and read random things. So the hardware prefetcher we'll talk about later is allow you to hide some of the latency you would get when you have to go over the interconnect, right? And then the last one is that, obviously, we talked about before when we talked about radix partitioning, is that you never want to have a core synchronize or block uh, waiting for the output of another core, like in the case of the multi-way multi uh, redistribution, you had to do this. And you don't have to do any latching or any, any uh, uh, synchronization barriers to make this work. So these are, these are sort of the, the, the high-level rules that they put forth that, that made them de why they designed their parallel short merge algorithm. Yes? So I don't know if you remember, but why will the random rights be lesser in this case? Because it seems like there is 
So, so his question is, why would random writes be less in the this case than in the, the multi-way case? So you only have to do one, it's only one random right here, right? Because it's when you do this redistribution, right? Then everything else can be done locally. In the, if we, if we go back to the, to the other guy here, all of these are, are random writes, right, to get the data over there. That's such a point. Um, I think, isn't it the, the only, you only have to do that for one of them and the other side is all local? So yeah, you, you still have to do that. You're basically still doing the same redistribution here. Um, yeah, I think he has a point. The other side doesn't have to do that. Yeah. The, other, uh, the, the other table is all local. Yeah, that's right. Yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> right, they, they, yeah, yeah. They, this side here still has to do, do this. Yeah, and in the, in in their case, in their case they, they only do the redistribution one side. Thank you. Yes. OK. All right, so now for the evaluation, uh, these are all the numbers from the, from the paper from the ETH guys. So within a single sort of test bed system, they're going to compare the three different sort merge join algorithms that we talked about. And they're also going to throw in the, a parallel NUMA aware version of radex partitioning sort of basically the same thing that we talked about last class. And for these, these evaluations, they're going to use a pretty beefy hardware. They have a four-socket machine uh, with Intel Xeons, and each socket has eight cores with two threads per core. So in total, they have 32 real cores and 64 if you count hyper-threading. And they have a half a terabyte DRAM. So in the first thing they want to compare is how much faster is the SIMD parallel sort algorithm versus the sort of off-the-shelf you know, sorting algorithm you would get with, from like the SDL. So long here on the uh, on the x-axis, they're they're going to scale up the number of tuples that are in, in the tables, and then you want to measure how much how many tuples you can get output over time. And so this is comparing with the the, the built-in ST, uh, STL sort algorithm that's in C plus plus eleven, which I think is intro sort, which is a hybrid algorithm. So it does this basically does quick sort at the beginning and then heap sort once once you have things uh, more sorted. And they're going to pair against the SIMD sorting stuff, the, the level one, level two stuff that we talked about before. And as you can see, obviously, uh, you're going to outperform it uh, uh, by a lot, especially when you only have a, sm a small number of, um, of tuples. And this is to be expected because down here you're doing everything in, like, in registers and, and, and CPU caches, whereas as you get farther along, larger sizes, you have to go to DRAM more, so you suffer a little bit, you pay a penalty. So in general, they're about 2.5 to 3x faster. And this is roughly coincides with what the, the Intel, Intel guys were reporting as well. All right, so now we can do our comparison of these different sort merge algorithms. So again, along the, along the x-axis, we have the M-way, the M-pass, and then the hyper implementation. So the first thing you see is that the M-way outperforms every other one. And actually, the, the, the hyper implementation is actually the, is the worst. So we, we're breaking up the, the different... Uh, we're breaking up the execution time of the different algorithms based on the, these four metrics here. And I'm labeling the, the merge process of the Bitonic merge networks of the sort of merge algorithm as S merge, and then the merge join process where you're actually comparing the sorted runs of the two tables as the M join uh, portion of the output. So in that case here, you, you, you see that the M way almost has zero uh, M join cost because it's done really fast in parallel at all the different cores. Whereas in the, uh, in the hyper case, this is a huge part of it because they're doing that sequential scan over the outer table at every single partition over and over again. So now if we, if we also map, so th these numbers here are in terms of cycles per output tuple, right? But if you actually want to measure throughput, right, it's sort of the inverse of that, which you would expect that this one, the, the, the algorithm that uses less instructions or less cycles per every tuple that it outputs will have a higher throughput rate. And in the case here, the, the hyper guys are the worst. So we can actually now measure how well these, these algorithms scale uh, when you increase the number of parallel threads that are running at the same time. So and this is running on a single machine that has 32 real cores. And then here, this region here from 32 to 64. 
this is sort of where hyperthreading uh, uh, kicks in. So what you'd want to see in your algorithm, if it was truly parallel and can scale linearly, is that as you double the number of CPU cores, you get double the performance. And in the case of both these algorithms, you more or less see that up until hyperthreading kicks in, which is again expected because now you're having, you know, you know, you're having program counters share share local caches on the CPU. Um, but overall, the the the, the multi-way merge sort of sort merge journal algorithm can get 315 million tuples per second, whereas the the hyper guys can only do 105. So this is a pretty significant difference between these two different algorithms. Um, I think so. I consider the the multi-wave one here to be the state-of-the-art sort merge join algorithm that exists today. But it doesn't help us against hash join. So hash join is still going to outperform the best sort merge join algorithm. So in this case here, we're comparing the multi-wave sort merge join algorithm versus the, a a parallel numeraware radex join algorithm, hash join algorithm that we talked about last class, and we're we're comparing it with different uh, table sizes. So here we start with 128 million by 128 million, and then different sizes as well. So what you see is that, with the exception for this one here, the hash join clearly outperforms the, the salt merge join. It's this one here that's actually kind of interesting. This is when you have now, uh, you're trying to join a database that has 1.6 billion tuples by another table that has 1.6 billion tuples. So yes, the hash join is, is better, but now you're sort of converging and having them be the same. So I would say, like, you know, this is a pretty large database. Uh, not everyone's going to be have something this big. So hash join is always going to, I mean, even regardless, hash join always performs better. So we can now uh, do a little f further investigation to see what's going on. If we vary the number of tuples, we can see that same trend that we saw before. When the number of tuples in the, in the tables we're trying to join is smaller, the hash join performs much, performs much better. But then as you get larger, they they start to converge, but this is still always going to be much faster. So this is sort of why, last class, I talked about how hash join was the most important operator you could have in your database system. Um, this is what pretty much everyone implements when you have an OLAP a database system, because again, the, the performance is clearly much better. Even if you do all tricks, all the possible tricks you can do to make sort merge go faster, hash join is always going to be better. Um, so any questions about sort merge join versus hash join? OK. Yes. I think it has to do with um. I think you're, at that that point you're just memory bound. It's just like you can't you can't get things off of mem the memory control fast enough. That's actually a good question. So his question is, if hash join is always better. Why would you even bother to have sort merge join? Um, and the answer is actually you want both. So one of the things that I have not talked about at all is we have not considered the impact of having sorted output in other operators of the query plan. So for example, let's say you have to do, uh, if your query has an order by clause, and the order by clause is, matches exactly what the join key is. If you do hash join, the output result of the operator is unsorted so then you have to run sort merge on it again, right? Uh, so if the query optimizer can recognize that I'm doing sorting and I know I'm going to have to do an order by later on up in the tree, although the sort merge join algorithm is going to be slightly slower, uh, I, I want to choose to do that because then I don't have to do additional sort. Now, it depends. This is what, this is what optimizers do. They, they can estimate how much, how much data is going to be produced by each operator. So if the join produces like five tuples, then using the hash joins will be better because if you have to sort five tuples, there's nothing. So this is why having good statistics can help you make better decisions. Um, there's, I mean, you can kind of do the same thing. You know, if you have sort of output, you can make possibly distinct uh, predicates go faster. You can make uh, aggregates go faster. But you can actually reuse the hash, possibly reuse the hashing stuff as well to make it go faster as well. So I guess the, the main thing is, again, if, you, if your output already needs to be sorted you, and you know it's going to be a big result, you may want to use the sort merge join. And this is something that the, all database systems should be able to figure out. Um, it's actually surprising. Like MySQL didn't have hash join up until like four or five years ago. right? They only had sort merge join. 
Um, and you know, when when it came out, I think five, version five six or something, it was big fanfare. Like, oh, they finally support hash join, even though you know it's, it's the, clearly the, the thing you want your system to have. So, right, so again, we want to have both. We want our database system to make a smart decision at runtime based on what the data looks like and what the query looks like about which one of these two algorithms uh, you want to choose. But chances are, I would say, most of the time, sort merge, or sorry, hash join is going to be always better. Yes. Yes. Because you will like, uh, run out of cash pretty soon, right? So, so his question is, uh, in the case of the, the, the level three merging part of, yeah. the, of the sort phase, is, isn't level three always going to be the slowest part of the sorting process because you have to go, now I'm being fed in cash? Yeah. Absolutely. And does having the first two levels actually help much? It means in, in terms of the Amdell's law, if that is the dominant part, then does the other two actually help? So, so his statement is, if level three is always going to be the slowest, uh, does having level one, level two be optimized with SIMD actually even help you at all? Uh, actually, actually, sure. Right? And we, we, saw, we saw that number here. Right? We saw this number here. So like, yes, at, at this point here, you're, you're doing the multi-way sort. <coughs> Right? Not everything's going to fit in your caches. You're going at the DRAM, but you're still going to be faster. Right? Because think about what the, what the, 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 the multi-way sorting part of the, of, of the sort phase, it's still doing that SIMD bitonic network sorting. Right? So that needs to be optimized. You're just looking at smaller chunks and combining them together. So making that be efficient, because that's the thing you're invoking all the time, it, you know, it will definitely speed things up. That's a good point. Are there any other questions? OK, so um, spend some time talking about uh, some of the hate mail I've gotten, because I know people are watching these videos. Uh, people think it's funny. People think, think you know, they're dangerous or whatever. So I'll just go through some examples of what people have written to me about the videos we've been putting online for the course. And just I want to show that I'm not shook. Right? I'm not threatened. We're still going to do this. We're still going to you know, treat databases as a hard game and keep coming to class and make, getting things done. So the first email is from, I'll just use initials, EPCJ from Brooklyn. Uh, he says my, that my database skills are weak. I look like a freak that hasn't showered in weeks in these videos. And I feel sorry for the students in the front row. If he was here, he'd go mug me. Weak, all right? Next guy says, this is JL from Seattle. He says, I hate you. I hate your course. I hate your fake ass lessons from the street. If I see you out in the cut, I'm going to stab you, make you bleed. I hope you burn in hell. No game, nothing, right? Next person is KB from Syracuse. They write, what is wrong with your face? Why do you look like a, a, a pile of hot brown dog sluice? I hate your database course. And then the last one we actually got this morning, this is from CM from San Jose. He says, I'm, you're never going to be Stonebreaker. You're never going to be DeWitt. You're never going to be Gray. You should just stop now. We fund the students' money and get a job at Taco Bell. That's where you belong. Um, I don't care. We're, we're still going to do this. We're still going to come back. We're still going to do databases hard because that's, you know, that's what we're here to do. All right. So next class, uh, we'll talk about physiological logging and recovery. Um, so this, so next lecture and then Monday's lecture will be sort of what I'll call sort of the halfway point of the course, where everything you, you've learned so far is enough for you to go out and build your own database system, right? Because now we do concurrent control, we've done indexes, we've done join algorithms, and we're done. We're going to do logging. Then everything that comes after that, you know, it's, it's one class before it's spring break and then after spring break, are all the extra stuff, the sort of the state of the art techniques that if you want to go build an advanced system you'll want to be able to use. So if you understand up to physical logic logging, and then you end up you know, getting sick or shot or whatever, you can't do the rest of the course, you should have enough skills out to go build your own database system from scratch. OK? All right, any questions? See you guys on Wednesday.